Now we're going to talk about what it takes to be a better teammate. And this is a harder topic, and it's more technical, and it might be a little more, a little less fast paced than the other topic is. But it's really important. So this is a typical application lifecycle management process here. And independent of Redgate, this is just a generic process that we can use to release software in production. Modern software delivery practices say that we want to be releasing software into production as often and as quickly as possible. And the reason why our goal is to release to production as quick as possible is because in the process of writing software, we make assumptions. And if, if I were going to draw that up, it would look like this. So um, let me open up MS Paint. I know that's kind of uh, you know a silly tool to use. But I'm going to open up MS Paint. And right here, these are assumptions, right? And I'll write that here, here. Then right over here is the reality. Right. And you can tell that hopefully there's some overlap into our assumptions and reality. But often, there isn't any overlap between those two things, or there's very little overlap between assumptions and reality. And so in order to test our assumptions against reality, these assumptions that we make when we write software, we need to deploy as quickly as we possibly can because we need to know if we're right or not. And the only way to know if we're right is if the users can see what we're doing and verify, yes, we're right. The longer we wait between assumptions and reality, the smaller this gap gets because reality will change and our assumptions won't. And the shorter we wait, the wider this gap gets and the higher chance that we'll have of having a successful software deployment. So because of that, the goal of any application lifecycle management process is to increase the amount of times that we're actually deploying to production, to shorten the development time in between deployments, and to increase the amount of deployments that we do overall. And if we say the reason why we're fundamentally doing that is so that we can increase our chances of success and decrease the gap between assumptions and reality, um, then we will continually strive to have a better and better deployment process, right? And so think about that for a second. If we know that, that having a short deployment process will have all of these benefits to us. What can we do to, to increase the number of deployments that we have to, um, and to decrease the time between we write software and we actually get it into the hands of users using it in a real way, right? What can we do? Um, there are a lot of things that we can do, right? We can, we can no longer have features that take two months to write, but instead have smaller features that take a week or two to write, right? We can do that. Two, we can not context switch developers on five different projects. Because if we have developers writing five projects at once, we increase the chance that none of those projects will hit production, right? Because we've, we've elongated the deployment time for all five of those projects by having developers context switch in between projects. Um, and three, we can automate our deployments rather than manually doing things, we can make sure that they happen in an automated fashion so that if the deployment takes five minutes versus a manual deployment might take five hours, we are much more likely to do a five-minute deployment more frequently than we are to do a five-hour deployment. So just getting our overall deployment time as short as possible will, will increase the number of deployments that we do and will decrease the time between concept and reality. And that will make this gap between our assumptions and reality much wider and increase our chances that the project will succeed. So 
I can't do much about some of those things, but a couple of those things I can do something about, and that is let's, let's have an automated deployment pipeline. And that's what this diagram is. This diagram is what it takes to have a great deployment pipeline. So right over here we have developers, and these developers write code. They write C Sharp code and JavaScript and SQL code, database code, database object, you know, DDL code, right? And then as they check in their changes into source control, that launches a build trigger. And that build trigger tells the continuous integration server to do three things here. Um, you know what, I wish I could show you these things. You know what, I'm going to use the code snipping tool so that I can write on this. But actually, I can zoom in and write. So, uh -oh. I think I have the ability to, yeah. There's a zoom it function that lets me write on this. But um, what I can do is just go back to paint and sh tell you what those three things are. So the CI server does three things. Usually, it can do a lot of things, right? There are a lot of things the CI server can do because it runs PowerShell as a script and it runs T-SQL as a script. And it can run just batch commands or executable processes. So that, that CI server could do a ton of things. But primarily, it does three things. It builds the software. It runs tests. And it deploys to an environment. And maybe that environment is staging. Maybe it's UAT for user acceptance testing. Maybe it's pre-production. And maybe it's even production. So the developer checks in. That launches the build trigger. The CI server runs. The CI server does those three things, builds, runs all the automated tests, deploys someplace. And then if we get a bunch of green lights that say that this build was good, all our tests pass, and we like what we see, we can hand that the build. Lost audio again. Okay, um, where the release management might have an automated way of getting those build artifacts to testing, QA, or staging, and then here there might be a DBA sitting here that might be willing to do what's called the gated um, deploy, where the the artifacts that came out of the CI server get manually inspected by the DBA. The DBA approves them, and the DBA just says yes, green and then hands those artifacts over to production, and now our application is uh, actually produced and in, in, you know, being used by users. So, so really, there's an overarching set of technologies here that's not just source control. Source control does a lot for us, but it also is a major fundamental component into a good release process. We cannot use a great CI server if we are not using source control. We cannot use great release management practices if we're not using source control. So really, good and fundamental use of source control is the building block and foundation for all these other things that will give us great benefits in the, um, in the future. Um, let's, what, just, what would happen if on the CI server right here, um, one of our tests failed? The CI server is also responsible for notification. So if Alan, Alan's a great developer, but everybody makes mistakes, Alan checks something in and says, um, sorry, um, Alan's a great developer, but Alan made a mistake, and so, um, so Alan breaks the build and one of the test breaks, the CI server automatically emails all the developers on the team that said, hey, the build is broken, don't get latest out of source control, and um, let Alan fix it. Alan goes in, he looks at the test, he knows immediately what he did. He puts, he patches it, he checks the patch into source control. That launches another build, it runs all the tests. Those tests goes, go green. And then the CI server automatically emails everybody and says, hey, the build is good now, everybody can go in and get latest now, and we can continue on with our development process. So that type of automation is invaluable in a team.